everyone to zoom into books today. We have a special guest author, Mary Ruart, and she is going to be talking about her book, which recently won an Indie Book Award. So take it away, Mary. Well, thank you, Kathy. My book is Death by Regulation, How We Were Robbed of a Golden Age of Health and How We Can Reclaim It. And I wrote this book because I felt like I had experiences that many people don't have an opportunity to have. And consequently, we have missing pieces of our ideas about the pharmaceutical industry, medical practice, and the nutrace nutraceutical or supplement industry. And basically, the thesis of my book is that if you put all the research together that has been done on the pharmaceutical industry and the regulations governing it, what you find is that the 1962 amendments to the Food and Drug Act, also known as the Kiefer-Harris amendments, really changed a lot in the pharmaceutical industry. They reshaped it into what it is today. And the biggest thing that they did is shifted our medical paradigm from prevention to treatment. And in the process of this, it's probably shaved five to 10 years off each of our lives. I realize that's a bold claim. And so I wanted to document it by writing Death by Regulation. And basically, the reason I know about this is because I was in the pharmaceutical industry for almost 20 years from 1975 to 1995. And I was astounded to go from academia to the industry and, and wondered how any drug could ever get to the marketplace because not only were there so many regulations to jump through, but they changed, it was a moving target. So let me tell you a little bit about that experience because once I left the industry, I recognized that I had seen things that most people just never get a chance to see. And so they have some misconceptions about how the industry works. They also don't realize that we've given up a lot of our ability to prevent disease because of these amendments. So the 1962 amendments to the Food and Drug Act were put in place because of the thalidomide crisis in Europe. Thalidomide was a safer sleeping drug than barbiturates. But what happened is, as more and more people took them, they came to realize that thalidomide could in fact prevent morning sickness when women were pregnant. And so women started taking thalidomide to inhibit morning sickness, and the company started advertising for that. And of course, back then, we really didn't appreciate how sensitive the fetus was to things that were safe for an adult. And so some of these babies in Europe were born with missing limbs, or they weren't born alive. And we actually had a few babies like this in the United States, not because it was approved by the FDA, because it was not. The FDA had enough power to stop it, and they were concerned about some other side effects that thalidomide had. But the testing was going on in the US, so we did have a few babies born without limbs. And so there was a lot of concern, understandably so. And so thalidomide, of course, never made it to the US market. But also, these regulations that became the 1962 amendments to the Food and Drug Act had been floating around in Congress for three years or so, and really didn't have anything to do much with safety. They were more about effectiveness and giving the FDA more power. And so they were put into place, even though they really didn't address the problem. And they had wide reaching effects, as I said, not only in medical practice, but in the pharmaceutical industry itself. And so I wanna talk a little bit about those because they impact on the way we think of pharmaceutical companies today. You know, we're paying awfully high prices for our pharmaceuticals. And most people think it's simply due to corporate greed. But if that were the case, every industry would be charging uh, huge amounts of money for their product and getting it. What makes it possible for the pharmaceutical industry to do that is because of these regulations. So let me 
get into that and explain a little bit. So these regulations, their big, their big claim to fame really was that they required that manufacturers demonstrate that their drugs were effective as well as safe. Prior to 1962, they had to demonstrate that they were safe for the intended use. Well, the effectiveness studies that the FDA started to require were actually very long and took a lot of money to produce. And there was a lot of uh, legal battles over this. So it wasn't until the 1970s that these really took effect in a big way. And the way the amendments were structured is they were open-ended. So in other words, more and more regulations could be made every year. Well, what this did um, was that the time to get a drug from the lab bench to the marketplace increased dramatically. Prior to the amendments, it was about four years. After the amendments, by the time the turn of the century happened, it was pushing 14 years. And that was, that's a long time. That's almost <laughs> another decade uh, that the average drug takes to get to market. Now, you don't have to be an economist to know that if you're over tripling the time that it takes a drug to get to market, you're going to have higher costs. And in fact, the costs don't increase linearly each year. They're increasing what we call exponentially. In other words, instead of this, they're like this. So they're going up very, very rapidly. And that's because these amendments allow the FDA to make more and more regulations every year. Now, if these regulations made us safer, we'd probably be pretty happy. But actually, they seem to have done just the opposite. For example, when we get drugs put on the market and the FDA approves them, we find that some of them are not very safe. So we take them off the market. And prior to the amendments, we took about 2.5% of the marketed drugs off the market, which isn't a whole lot, and, but it's... It's significant because sometimes they had, you know, bad effects. And the reason that these drugs get through the process in the first place is our scientific knowledge just isn't good enough to enable us to eliminate all the side effects through animal testing or the limited human testing that we do. After the amendments, the average withdrawal rate from the market of FDA approved drugs is 3.3%. So it went up, not down. And if you've looked at studies that have happened in recent years, it looks like there's an awful lot of people dying from the side effects of drugs currently on the market. Why is that? Well, before the amendments were passed, it was easier for companies to take a natural product, something that our body actually makes, jump through the four years of regulatory hoops, and put it on the market. So when our body saw it, it could handle it. But after the amendments, after 14 years of extra studies, um, it was so costly that companies needed a patent. And it's hard to get a patent on natural products, usually. It's not impossible, but it's hard. So what ended up happening is the drug companies started saying, we're only gonna develop um, compounds or drugs that have a patent, which basically meant they were only going to develop drugs that our body used to see. And when I first joined the Upjohn company, this rule was not in effect in our company. We did develop uh, uh, drugs that were not patented, but after a few years, it just became impossible to recover costs. So patents were necessary. Now I have several patents myself, and I can tell you from my experience that there's a bit of gamesmanship in getting a patent. If you think about it, if you're a patent officer, how do you distinguish what's really new? You know, because in science, we 
build on each other's work. So it's very difficult to always feel that the patent process is fair. Anyhow, back to, back to this uh, business of less safe drugs. There's a problem here, obviously, if you're making drugs that the body has not seen before. And usually a natural product is taken and an extra chemical group is put on it so that it can stay in the body longer, so you can get a patent, or that it'll work better with that extra chemical group on it. And so patents have become necessary in the industry. In fact, if you again look at studies in the industry, what you find is that the chemical industry and the pharmaceutical industry are the ones that primarily need patents to survive. And that's because these are industries which are highly regulated, which means the cost of getting them to market is also very high. Now I told you earlier that the main thrust of the amendments was actually to increase the effectiveness of the drugs on the market. But studies subsequent to the amendments showed that this really hadn't happened. Well, why not? Well, because if you think about it for a moment, when doctors gave the drugs to their patients, if it didn't work, they quit prescribing it before the amendments were passed. And that happened after the amendments too. So bottom line is that the marketplace had already basically uh, gotten rid of most of the ineffective drugs. There were a lot of studies done on this and the biggest number that came out of the studies were that maybe we have increased the effectiveness 10%, but we've increased the cost to the consumer. What you pay at the pharmacy about 800% because that's the cost of getting all these 14 years of studies done. Now there's another problem too. Most people don't realize the FDA doesn't do any of these studies. They just tell the pharmaceutical industry what they have to do. And then we quite literally used to send a truckload of documentation to the FDA and they spend six months to two years looking over it and deciding if it's good enough. And that's of course part of the 14 years. So in order to make the FDA faster in evaluating all of this data, what they did in 1992 is they passed the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. And what this did is companies could pay $100,000 to the FDA so that they could get more examiners to look over all this data. And in doing so, they could speed up the process. So instead of mm, two years-ish, it was cut down to maybe six months. And so the 14 years went to about 13-ish years, which of course saved many lives. Because let me explain what this delay does. It means that if you have a disease and you are waiting for a life-saving drug to come on the market, you're in trouble. And if you remember back, the AIDS patients had this trouble. If any of you saw the Dallas Buyers Club, an award-winning movie, you saw that the FDA persecuted and prosecuted AIDS patients who were simply trying to stay alive by importing drugs from other countries or selling nutritional products that might help them stay alive longer or in many cases they hired black market chemists to create the same drugs that we were testing under FDA guidelines and distributing them throughout the AIDS community. So by the time the FDA gave us permission to test our drugs and people, every AIDS patient in the country that wanted these drugs had already had them and were resistant. So we couldn't test our drugs until new patients were diagnosed. And that's what we did. Because the AIDS patients realized, hey, if we don't break the law, we're not going to be alive. 
And again, if you watch the Do uh, Dallas Buyers Club movie, you saw that <laughs> the gentleman that was the focus of this movie actually outlived all the expectations that the doctors had for him because he was taking drugs from overseas. He was taking nutritional supplements. He was taking probably drugs that the pharmaceutical industry was looking at, but hadn't been able to get through the FDA process as of yet. So, and I was working in the AIDS um, research at that time. So, so I was aware of all this. Now, it turns out that someone has made a calculation of how many lives the drugs currently on the market save. So you can calculate the number of people who have died waiting for life-saving drugs due to the amendments. Because we know it took four years to 14 years. And you can, you can actually see it rising decade by decade. So what I did in Death by Regulation is I made that calculation for every decade. And basically 15 million Americans probably died prematurely waiting for life-saving drugs because of these amendments that increase the time it takes for a drug to get from the lab bench to the marketplace without any increase in safety and a tiny little bit at most increase in effectiveness. But that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is that because companies are spending their money jumping through more regulatory hoops, they don't have money to invest in as much innovation. And again, studies have been done on this. And the smallest estimate I have seen is that we've lost at least half of our innovation based on how many drugs drop out of development for economic reasons late in late stage or mid-stage development. So there are also a lot of drugs that drop out before development even starts. And I'm going to give you a very personal example from my own career. I actually got a call from an FDA examiner one day. He, he said, Dr. Ruart, I understand that you just filed for a patent for prostaglandins and liver disease. I said, yes, that's true. He said, we are so excited about this because there's nothing for liver disease. 100,000 people die every year and all we can give them is bed rest. So we're, we're gonna do everything we can to help you get this drug to market. Now, just a little aside, prostaglandins today are called icosinoids. If you're taking fish oil, you are taking the building blocks for what we call the good icosinoids. So, you know, that's kind of giving you, you an idea of how this overlaps with nutrition. Uh, anyhow, so we were really excited and I was young and naive, so I thought we would quickly get this product to market. But the problem is the FDA has to obey its own regulations, right? So it, at that time, you had to have two studies done in the United States that had a statistical significance of a P less than 0.5. 0 0.05, for those of you who are technically inclined. Uh, what it means is that we had to have a lot of people in the study so that we were pretty sure that the result we got wasn't by chance. Now the problem is when you are actually healing a disease that's never been healed before, there's a lot of unknowns. You know, we didn't know how much prostaglandin we had to give. We didn't know how often we had to give it. We didn't know how long we had to give it for. You know, liver disease takes a while to happen and to be, uh, to be um, bad enough that you need a liver transplant. So, and we also didn't have a way to measure easily the reversal of this because what happens with the liver is it kind of gets a lot of scar tissue. And it's not always the same in each part of the liver. So how are we going to measure this? Do we take biopsies, which are, you know, we have to surgically go in and take a piece of the liver 
and, and how much would that mean when it's not evenly distributed? How could you measure the scar tissue? Could we use a blood parameter? Well, you know, we didn't know these things because it had never been done before. And we didn't know what the FDA would accept. And even though they were trying to be encouraging, we quickly realized that if we didn't guess right on all of these parameters the first time, we wouldn't get statistical significance that the FDA required. And then we'd have to start over. And because these studies were expected to take years, by the time we actually made it to market, our patent would have run out and we could not possibly recoup our investment. So that's why a lot of products drop out before development, jumping through the regulatory hoops, even really starts to happen. And so, I think instead of 50% loss of innovation, we're probably closer to 80%. But I used 50% to make my calculation of how many lives were lost due to innovation loss. And I assumed that the drugs that were lost were only 25% as effective as the ones currently on the market. And I came out with 27 million American lives lost due to loss of innovation. And if you put those numbers together, basically we've each lost about five years of our lives to these amendments. But of course in the beginning, I told you a little bit about how it was five to 10 years. So where did I get the 10 years? Well, that's the shift from prevention to treatment. I had to take a guess. So that number isn't solid, but let me tell you, how important it is and give you some examples. So for example, in the 1980s, we knew that if a woman took 800 micrograms of folic acid a day, that she could almost wipe out her chance of having what we call neural tube birth defects, which includes spina bifida and some other horrendous effects that usually result in a child being institutionalized or aborted because you can test for it in utero. Obviously the folic acid manufacturers wanted to tell the American public about this because the women need folic acid in the first month or two of pregnancy when they don't even realize they're pregnant. But the FDA told the folic acid manufacturers if they even mentioned these studies, which were published in scientific journals, that they would be prosecuted. You might say, why is that? That's stupid. Well, <laughs> according to the 1962 amendments, every product that wanted to make a health claim had to jump through these 14 years of regulatory hoops. And folic acid is a natural product. It didn't have patents. So if a folic acid manufacturer even took it through 14 years of, of regulatory hoop jumping and they made the claim every other folic acid manufacturer probably could too. So of course nobody was gonna do that. So American women did not know about this. Now in 1992, the Center for Disease Control, another government agency started talking about this. They said, young women of childbearing potential should be taking this folic acid. But the FDA told the folic acid manufacturers if they even mentioned the CDC's recommendation in their advertising that they would be prosecuted. Then in the mid 1990s, the FDA recognizing of course that folic acid was important for healthy babies decided to require that manufacturers of grain products like cereals and bread had to fortify their product with folic acid. But of course, women weren't getting the right amount of folic acid because it all depended on how much grain products they consumed. And so the American women still had babies with neural tube defects or they were aborted if they were found in utero. Meanwhile, overseas in Europe, the governments were advertising this and encouraging the folic acid manufacturers to go ahead and supplement their women with folic acid. And so basically 
the amendments, which were supposed to prevent another thalidomide, actually created what I call the American thalidomide by denying American women the knowledge of folic acid that could have helped them prevent neural tube defects. So depending on what assumptions you make, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 or more American babies were born with these defects and maybe another 10,000 more aborted, which makes it even worse on a per capita basis than Europe experienced with thalidomide. So these amendments actually are doing the opposite of what they were intended to do. And actually, this is not an unusual finding. Oftentimes, regulations that are meant to protect us actually backfire and hurt us. And of course, there's some reasons for that that we can get into in the Q&A if you want to go ahead and <laughs> make a question or get in touch with me after, after you see this presentation. But I want to back up a little bit. You know, I told you that the 14 years was shortened by about a year with the passage of the 1992 Prescription Drug User Fee Act. It started out as $100,000 of payment that drug companies would make to the FDA so they could hire more examiners. Now it's something in the neighborhood of $2.5 million per new drug. This means that the section of the FDA that reviews all this data that the drug companies generate is now primarily funded by the drug industry. About 50 to 70% of their salaries are actually coming from these user fees. Well, this creates a big conflict of interest and in fact resulted, resulted in the most deadly drug that the American people have ever experienced getting to the market when it shouldn't have, and that's Vioxx. There was a lot of data showing that Vioxx probably increased heart attacks. And one of the FDA examiners went to his boss and said, hey, you know, this drug causes heart attacks. We better not uh, approve it. And his superior told him, hey, our client is the drug industry. And notice it didn't say the American public, the drug industry. So we're going to approve this product. And eventually, because this <laughs> examiner put it out, you know, uh, actually went to a meeting and talked about this, the word got out and Vioxx was eventually withdrawn. But in the meantime, depending on what assumptions you make, according to the FDA's assumptions, uh, about 25,000 Americans probably died because this drug caused heart attacks. And depending again on what assumptions you make, the number's probably even bigger. I suspect it's quite a bit larger than that. And in the book, I go into my reasons why I think that. Okay, so bottom line, we have a situation where these regulations that were meant to protect us are actually allowing drugs to go to the market that are less safe. This has been compounded by the industry's co-opting of the FDA through these user fees. And in addition, when we go to the pharmacy, we're paying huge amounts of money for our drugs because the relationship between what we pay at the pharmacy for a brand new drug and what the manufacturer has to pay to jump through the FDA's hoops is directly correlated. In other words, if you plot the prices at the pharmacy against the, against the cost of getting it to market, you see a straight line. So if we want to lower drug prices, all we need to do is get rid of these regulations, which cost us a lot of money, but aren't giving us safer or more efficacious drugs and are preventing us from using, preventing us from knowledge about supplements that could heal us. And I'll give you one more example of that. The Upjohn company was working on a class of compounds called Lazaroids, and they were named that way. They were named after the biblical Lazarus because they 
they pretty much did everything except raising someone from the dead. I was on the airplane with someone who knew about this, and he said, you know, I really would like to try these Lazaroids. Can you get them for me? And I said, well, you know, it's not marketed yet, so I'm not sure, but I'll check. So I talked to the project manager, and he said, we can't give this drug out, but just tell him to take lots of vitamin E because it will do the same thing. So why are we spending all this money on Lazaroids if we could have just recommended vitamin E? Well, just like with the folic acid, we couldn't say anything about vitamin E without jumping through all the regulatory hoops and basically making it go generic first day on the market. And something similar happened with fish oil. Fish oil is a wonderful product, especially if you get something pure and I have to let you know that you do need to get a pure product and not all the products out there are pure, free from oxidation, you know, heavy metals. So what they did is they took some of the components of fish oil and added a chemical group so they could get a patent, jump through the hoops, the regulatory hoops, and have something on the market that they could charge a lot of money for. Now, my sister was eligible for a prescription fish oil, so she checked with her doctor, and her copay would have been about the same as if she had gone and bought um, a really pure fish oil and took that instead. And, of course, her insurance company would have paid five times that. So this is another reason that these amendments are hurting us, because <laughs> we can't use natural products the way we used to for prevention or treatment. And consequently, we're paying a lot of money unnecessarily. Now, again, I don't know how many years of our lives we've lost because we don't have proper prevention anymore. And I could go on and tell you more stories about our loss of prevention, but, but I'm guessing it could be as much as another five years. So somewhere between five to 10 years of our lives have been lost by regulations that don't give us better safety or effectiveness and simply increase the cost of what we pay at the pharmacy. I'm going to stop there and look at the questions that have come in to see if I can, I can answer them. Yes, okay, so the question is about the upgrading of cancer drugs once the original drug becomes generic. Yes, now, now the patent game becomes, and I call it a game because there is some gamemanship involved, uh, becomes important in terms of the bottom line. So if they can change the formulation in a way that makes it more effective, if they can tweak it or add it to some other regimen um, then and get a patent from it then yes then they can um, they can continue to sell it and make some money and also you mentioned uh, that the side effects from some cancer drugs is another form of cancer yes one of the sad things that has happened even before the 1962 amendments is that doctors who pioneered a new treatment for cancer were prosecuted. Some were driven out of the country. Here in Texas, where I am, uh, we have a Dr. Stanislav Brzezinski, who is hauled into court every few years by either the medical board or the FDA, kind of working together, because he, he found something in the urine um, of non-cancer patients that was missing from cancer patients. So he thought he would give the things that healthy patients have to his cancer patients. And he actually had some success. The problem is an individual doctor doesn't have the $2.5 billion that it now costs to get a drug through the regulatory hoops. That's the estimate. It's been contested, but basically part of it is because that number has to include the failures. It's not just the drug that makes it to market that determines the price of a drug. It's all the failures, and the failures are about eight to 10 times 
the <laughs> number that make it to market. So that drug has to pay for all those too. And, and these drugs that we have, these, these uh, really devastating chemotherapy drugs can be very toxic. I have lost, uh, I've lost a sister and my mother to those chemotherapeutic drugs. They're very, very toxic. And there are other things that one could do, um, alternative therapies, that are helpful. And I personally have used some of them myself to uh, help my uh, cancer levels go down. And uh, as far as I know, I'm cancer free, free right now. So, you know, but those things have been very difficult to come by because unless you are into the sciences and know where to go for this stuff, uh, it's hard. It's hard because the doctors are persecuted. Uh, the other question is, do I think COVID-19 needs a vaccine? And if so, is it unrealistic to think it can be fast-tracked? <laughs> Unfortunately, the COVID, um, the virus that causes COVID is of a family that's very, very difficult to make a good vaccine for. You know that the flu vaccines that we have every year are are not 100% effective. They're almost always much less than 50% effective. And the SARS viruses, which the COVID virus is one of that family, as far as I know, there hasn't been a very successful vaccine for it. So the important thing, the important thing is to boost up your immune system. How do you do that? Well, a lot of it, again, is through nutrition. I want to tell you a little bit about nutrition to get you excited about looking into this because, you know, when I was doing research, we didn't have all the genetic tools that researchers have today. So we couldn't take out a gene from our animals and make, uh, make what we call a knockout mouse. We had to do it the old fashioned way. What we did to make our animals sick because they were so healthy. Our rats wouldn't get sick. So what did we do? For example, I wanted to create a model in, in the rat that looked like alcoholic liver disease. So what did I do? I took away one of its B vitamins, choline, and I got something in rats that very much resembled alcoholic liver disease. Why was that? Because when alcohol is detoxified by the body, it has to use that B vitamin to do it. And so it depletes your body's store. And when the store of that B vitamin is gone, you start getting problems with your liver. So what the researchers learned back in my day was that if you wanted to stay healthy, you had to optimize your nutrition. You didn't just have to have the lowest amounts to get symptoms, you had to optimize it. And that if it wasn't optimized, you could get sick. So this is very important. And um, if you want a one-stop shopping place to go to learn about nutrition, I highly recommend Life Extension Foundation. Uh, LifeExtension.com is their URL, or you can type in lef.org for, you know, Life Extension Foundation. And there you'll see reviews. They have a they have something called protocols for disease, disease protocols. So if you go in there and you put in a particular disease like cancer, it will give you a, a lot of information about the drugs on the market for it and a lot about the nutritional supplements and alternative therapies that one could try. And so that's a really good one-stop shop. Obviously, there's so much information out there, I would say you're going to want to go elsewhere also, but that's a one-stop shopping place. Uh, the other thing I'd recommend is go to drsears.com, that's drsears.com, drsears.com, and learn about the zone diet. Um, I know Barry Sears personally, and uh, his science is great. It actually, what he did is he found a diet to optimize prostaglandins or eicosanoids. He is the person who really put forth the idea of taking high quality fish oil on a regular basis. He has a number of products that help you get into the zone. He worked with athletes, Olympic athletes, to optimize how you get into the zone. 
And so his other website is zonediet.com. So it's drsears.com or zonediet.com. And he's been having a lot of seminars on how to prevent, not prevent, I should say, but how to boost your immune system so that if you do get COVID, you won't have it for very long, hopefully. And also I want to point out that the the newest and greatest thing that I've seen recently on COVID has been treatment with, um, um, I want to say some asthma compounds, some anti-inflammatory asthma compounds. And, you know, I, can, I have a link and if you'll, just a minute and I'll put it in the chat box so that it can be passed on. because I think this is, this is breaking news, so to speak. <laughs> and I thought it was excellent, and here it comes. So that is something that is worth watching. And you can actually buy the compound that this uh, doctor talks about. He says he has not lost a single COVID patient because he gives them this asthma medicine, not in an inhaler as it's sold, but in a nebulizer. Again, it's, it's a good thing to be aware of and uh, a way in which you, know, you might be able to help yourself should you come down with COVID. We still don't know a lot, so you know, take all of this with a grain of salt, but you know, boosting your immune system is the way to go if you can do it. Are there other questions? It doesn't look like it, so I'm going to end by saying that I've really enjoyed talking to you today. I hope that you will feel free to visit my website at ruart.com. That's R-U-W-A-R-T.com. And when you do that, if you go to the homepage on the lower right-hand corner, you'll see links to all of my social media, which I keep much more updated than my website. <laughs> <laughs> and what else would like, if you want to contact me or have more questions after you've seen this video, feel free to go to the About tab on my website, and you'll see a place where you can contact me. I answer all of my emails, so if for some reason you don't hear from me, please try again. I, I, really, I really enjoy hearing from the people I react with and interact with on these things, and so I, I really hope that it, you'll feel free to get in touch with me. And again, my book is Death by Regulation, How We Were Robbed of a Golden Age of Health and How We Can Reclaim It. And in there, I do describe why I think we were on the cusp of the golden age of health and show how these amendments really, really created a problem that has cost each of us years of our lives and that ripples outward into the world to cost lives in other countries as well. So thank you. Uh, I really appreciated the time you put into listening to me. And again, if you have questions, don't hesitate to get in touch with me.